Hello everybody, it's your virtual car friend Netgear57 here once again today with a new video. And today it's a special video. On that occasion, I'm wearing a special. This is a GWS5600 carbon fiber G-Shock, only sold in Japan import model. Can't get this in the US. And on that note, let's talk about importing cars. <laughs> I bought my Sylvia from an importer out of Long Beach. After that, I imported two cars myself, and it's really not as difficult as you'd think. It might seem like this daunting, insurmountable task, you know, no way me, a, a peon, a, a, some normal person would never be able to do that. No, that's that's not the case. You can do it. As long as you got the money up front, it's something you can do, unless you live in California. So let's get right into it. The first thing you're going to need to do, and it's probably going to be the hardest, is looking for an exporter in Japan that you can trust. That might be hard to do, I'll freely admit, but do the research, ask around, open accounts with various exporters, ask them questions. What are the fees? What's the process? How are you going to help me make the right purchase? Are you going to leave me high and dry? You let me bid on anything, bid on straight garbage. I'm not going to pretend like there's not scams out there, but you have to do some legwork and research to protect yourself. The place I use is a company called JPC, jp-c.com. I mean, I can't speak for him now. The guy I used to work with, my account manager, he doesn't work there anymore. And uh, he was going to open his own importing place. And I've been trying to get a hold of him, but he's kind of gone off the map. So Takashi, if you're listening, hit me up. Hit me up on WhatsApp, dude. Yeah, let's get back together. But I mean, at least I can say that JPC is at least a real reputable company. Oh, this is not bad. A little smoky. So you found your exporter. They'll likely give you access to a website that allows you to look at all the all the auctions in Japan, find something you want. And uh, if you're an idiot, you know, you probably want an S13 or something. And it'll give you options like upcoming, maybe past month or past two months. That's a good tool to use if you want to try to, you know, check out the market, gauge the market, see what they're going for. And in that that case, you can also see if a car has been listed multiple times because the more a car has been listed, the higher the probability is that the guy is going to sell it. You know, if he has a reserve and it's not meeting the reserve, every time he's listing it, he's having to pay money. So the more he pays money, the more he's like, Fuck it, you know, get rid of this car, let it go, let it sell. You'll also be able to look at a quick rundown of all the cars, you know, the year, the mileage, the grade, things like that. Let's go ahead and take a look at a car, right? Let's say you're not an idiot. You don't want an S13. Let's say you're a Chad. You, let's say you want a Celsius. All right, so here's a 91 Celsius, over 25 years old. Great, you can import it. Even if you can't read Japanese, there's still a lot that the Gaijin can gather from the auction sheet. At the top right here, you're gonna see the grade of the car. The grades are used at the auction as kind of a measurement tool, basically how good the car is. And they're gonna use, the auction houses use grades one through six, and then they have S, R, and RA. You're really never gonna see a six or an S that's basically for newer cars like 12 months old or newer or 36 months old or newer as an American trying to import 25 year old car you're never gonna see that five is gonna be the highest you'll see importing 25 year old car and that's gonna be a car that's like I want to say less than 50,000 kilometers but generally you're gonna see you know four four and a half is what is what you're shooting for ideally now that's not to say a three is out of the question because a three is pretty much just your average car you know normal dents dings bumps, bruises, stuff like that. And I kind of feel like gee, the Japanese take a little bit better care of their car. I think they have a they have a stricter inspections out there and people are more willing to take care of the car, I guess. You know, that's anecdotal, not necessarily the case all the time, but I wouldn't bid on anything lower than a three. Four, four and a half is prime. Five would be fantastic, but that's that car is going to go for a lot. OK, now let's talk about R and RA cars. So R's and RA cars are cars that have been in an accident and they've been repaired, with RA being a minor accident that was repaired and R being something more significant that was repaired. Now, should you count those out? Not necessarily. It doesn't take a whole lot in Japan for a car to be labeled as R or RA. And realistically, most of the cars you see at importers are gonna be R grades. Get the opinion of your exporter, talk to them. Hey, look, when I'm looking at this car, what do you think? It's an R grade. And they'll, you know, they'll give you the no bullshit assessment. Oh yeah, that, that car doesn't look bad. You know, it only, it looks like it was rear-ended and they changed the rear bumper, you know, no big deal. But it could be worse. There's also, if it doesn't have a grade, it just, it just have like maybe asterisk or a star, that car is a piece of fucking shit. Don't even look at it. Next thing that's gonna be easy to check or a normie is gonna be the mileage. As you can see in this one, the Celsius has 133,578 kilometers. Now, just to the right of the kilometers, there's an empty box. That's gonna be the box you wanna look at. If there is a star or an asterisk in that box, 
that represents that there's a mileage discrepancy on that car. So whatever mileage is listed, you know that's not correct. Now, maybe you don't care. Cool, I guess, you know, no big deal. But if the car is claiming some kind of crazy low mileage, do they call it mileage? Do they, do, do they call it kilometerage over there? Because of the metric system? You're a smart motherfucker, that's right. I don't know. But if it's claiming low mileage and you have the asterisk, you know that's a huge red flag. Don't spend big money on that car thinking, oh, I'm going to get a fucking 40,000 kilometer Sylvia and it has the asterisk. Asterisk. No, it's not a 40, who knows what it is, it's a TMU. All right, now to the right of the mileage, you're gonna see two boxes, one says AT and the other says AAC. AT, that represents its automatic transmission, AT. If it was a manual, it would have F, five or f6 i'm assuming that means five forward gears and six forward gears i don't know but that if it's f5 or f6 there that means it's manual transmission and then the amount of gears and aac represents the car has air conditioning the extra a on some of these i think that means automatic air air conditioning or auto climate control or it'll simply say ac and it just has air conditioning you know manual turn the fucking fan on and the ac turns on this doesn't necessarily mean it works it just means that the car was equipped with it now we're going to go to the bottom right hand portion and then on that little diagram of the car and that's going to be where you can get Get a lot of quick information on the car if you know what you're looking for and it'll tell you where there's scratches dents rust things like that now a represents a scratch or a crack c is corrosion s is rust u is a dent au is a dent with a scratch w is there's repair history in the area it's noticeable it could be repaint stuff like that a single x is a part that needs to be replaced so let's say the bumper's fucked up but it hasn't been replaced or it's completely missing, it'll, they'll put a single X there. And then XX is something that's been replaced. So two X's, that piece has been replaced. That's a good indicator. If you're looking at an R grade car and you look at that little diagram and it has XX on the hood and XX on the front bumper, you can pretty much deduce that the car was in a front end collision and the bumper and the hood were replaced. Or maybe it wasn't that bad and it's just XX on the bumper, maybe W on the fender or W on the hood. It just got repainted. So it's a pretty good tool to use. Okay, so in this case, looking at the Celsius, you can see there's a couple scratches there on, on the front bumper, maybe a scratch there on the hood and you can see they, they accompanied the A with a letter. So that's that's showing the severity of the scratch or the dent or, or what have you. And uh, two, you know, kind of a it's a it's a decent a decent enough scratch one is a minimal scratch as you can see on the on the rear deck lid the rear bumper and then you can also see there's a scratch and a dent on the passenger door and uh, another scratch above the rear wheel well so overall you know not bad for 1991 car i would say this is a candidate to bid on so you would take this car you know i like the way this is looking and i'm going to send this up to my account manager and say hey take a look at this car it looks good to me but i want your opinion because i mean you can't fucking read the moon rooms i can't read them. Yeah, I'm sure that there's going to be some in the comment. Oh, dude, it says actually this. Yeah, you know, good for you. I can't read it. That's why I'm paying this guy to, to look at it for me. So he's going to come back and tell you, okay, it says this, 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 this. Yes, this. I believe this car is worth bidding on. All right, so cool. Awesome. The guy says it's great. You're going to bid on the car. Now, you let's say you bid. You bid on this car and you want. Great. What now? Well, you, you pay the motherfucker. In my case, I had to pay a little bit more for inland shipping to a port. This Celsius, I did bid on that and I won this Celsius. I ended up paying a total of 504,305 yen on a 260,000 yen winning bid. And uh, you can see the breakdown here. Now you can see this includes uh, inland shipping, like I said, whatever fees that the exporter had and also shipping. They shipped the car to the United States for me. And that was all for 504,000 yen, roughly $5,000. So yeah, pay them, boom. They'll take care of everything and send you all the paperwork you need. And the car is now on a ship. Roll on, roll off transport on its way to the United States. And that usually takes about from purchase you know, to arrive in two to four months, I guess I would say, you know, three months is, is about average, but cool, you're halfway there. The export company is going to send you the bill of lading, the bill of sale, export certificate, which is going to be your car title. And then the translation of the export certificate, which is like it sounds, it's a translation of it because it's all in you don't know what it says. DMV doesn't know what it says. So this is the official translation of this paper. It's basically all the paperwork that, you, that you're going to need when the car arrives in port and then uh, to claim it and to officially import it. Now, in my case, when I imported this Celsius, I was living in El Paso, Texas at the time. The car was going to arrive in Galveston and that's about 12 hours away. Not close. Pretty far. As far as you can get and probably I'm still be in the same state. So in my case, I use a customs broker because you got to ask yourself, if you live far away, I paid 300 for the customs work. And then that company also does shipping and I paid them another 600 to ship the car from Galveston to El Paso. So that's about 900 bucks all in. To me, that was worth it because you have to ask yourself, what is what's going to be the total cost for me? If I were to go from El Paso to Galveston, this 12 hours, I'm either going to drive or I'm going to fly. Either one is going to cost me money. 
I'm gonna have to stay in a hotel room. I'm gonna have to run around Galveston, try to figure out where I need to go, who I need to pay to get this car imported, to pay, pay the customs off. And then I have to drive the car back you know, pray that nothing's wrong with it, drive it back or rent a truck and tow it back, rent a trailer. And then not only that, taking the time off of work, what are you losing? It's to me, $900 was completely worth it. If I lived in Houston, right next to Galveston, probably wouldn't be the case. I would just figure out what I need to do, go pay the hundred bucks duty and take care of it myself. But that's where you have to weigh your options. Customs broker is going to be the easiest way, but you're going to pay a little bit more. So again, in my case, I use the broker. What they're going to ask you for the power of attorney, and you're going to have to fill out a couple forms, send them the forms the exporter sent you, and then you're going to do um, your EPA form 3520, which is basically an exemption form, and I'll show it here. You're claiming an exemption from EPA standards because the car is 21 years of age or older, and then the Department of Transportation form HS7, which is stating that the vehicle, you can import it because it is 25 years of age or older. 21 years of age of older for EPA, 25 years of age and older for DOD. Okay, once Customs releases the vehicles, they're going to stamp those forms, date them, and sign them, and you need that. Don't lose, those are super fucking important. Make copies of those because you're going to need them later. All right, so now, a shipping company arrived, the fucking transporter came through, and you have the car now. You They, they drop off this fucking car with a dead battery in your driveway, put the trickle charger on it or buy a new battery, and now what? What, what, what the f*** do I do now, Ned? This is probably going to be one of the biggest hurdles you face in the importing process, but it's going to be insurance. Getting the car insured might be more of a headache than, than you think. If you have USAA, perfect. No problem. No issues. They'll insure anything. It might not be the cheapest, but you'll get it insured and you can drive the car. No stipulations. Do whatever you want with it. If you have Geico and you ask them, they're going to tell you kick rocks. They don't give a f But, you know, I think the best way to go about it is go in and talk to your insurance agent in person at a physical office. Don't call because if you call and as soon as you give them this non-standard VIN number that's not a US, 12 or 14 digit VIN, they don't know what the f to do. They lock up and they'll they'll tell you, oh, um, well, sir, uh, we don't actually deal with this. Just because they want you off the line, they don't care. Go in, talk to somebody in person. That's probably gonna be your best bet. If the car is not gonna be your daily driver, it's a little bit easier because then you can get specialty or collector car insurance on it. That does come with some stipulations, but it's a trade-off, it's worth it. I insure my Sylvia through Classic Auto Insurance. Very good company. They got nothing but good things to say. I have some stipulations because it is a, a specialty insurance but that's fine. I, the car has to stay in a garage. Cool. I, I'll put it in a garage anyway. Limited mileage. I think I, I can drive 5,000 miles a year. I used to be able to drive the car to work, but when I moved, my policy changed and they no longer offered that specific one. So now I can't drive the car to work anymore, which I mean, it, that kind of sucks, but it's, I guess it's a decent trade-off. I only pay like, I think four or $500 a year in insurance. Now, when I say classic car insurance, a lot of people immediately think of Haggerty and that's what I did too. I called Haggerty when I was looking for quotes and their stipulations were off the fucking wall. I couldn't even drive the car like out to a restaurant on a date. Like it was hyper boomer. You can only do parades and car shows. I was like, like y'all are fucking wild. I don't know if they've changed since then, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend Haggerty. Okay. So now that you have the insurance, you can get the temporary tag for your car in Texas. So in Texas, normally you can do it online, go online, Texas DMV. I don't know what the f then get a temp tag because your car doesn't have a standard US VIN. The online, it's going to, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So go, go to your local office, tell them you want to get temp tags, show me insurance, explain to them. This is an imported car. It's a non-standard VIN. When they look at the insurance, they'll feel a little bit better, you know, cause it's like, okay, it's, it's on this official document. It, the car has to be real. And then you can drive the fucking car around. Finally, legally, you can put this paper tag on your imported car and drive around and get stuff done for 30 days. So what do you need to get done? Done. I'm talking about Texas here, so it might not be exactly the same in, in whatever lame ass state you live in, but in Texas, this is what you need to do. So you're going to go get the car inspected. It should be old enough in, in every, I think in every Texas county, you don't need to get emissions on it because it's old enough that you'll just do the safety inspection. So go get the car safety inspected. Then you're going to do another inspection. It's called the VIN inspection. This you only have to do it once, and that's when you register the car the first time, and when you apply for a Texas title, because it's imported. They're just going to look at all the VIN numbers on the car, run them against a national or a worldwide, I should say stolen car database. All they want to do is make sure that your car isn't stolen, it wasn't stolen in another country and then sold and imported into the US to try to, I guess, keep the heat off of it. 
So you got to find a place to do that. Call your local PD, call a DMV, let them know what you're doing and they'll they'll be able to give you a phone number, lead you in the right direction. I think it costs like 30 bucks to get it done and it takes like 15 or 20 minutes. You, you just have to take like check or money order to pay them no cash. Not a big deal. All right, you're in the home fucking stretch now. You got your state inspection. You got your insurance. You got your VIN inspection. Now you get all that shit. And you're going to go into the county tax office, the DMV, whatever, to go register your vehicle. This is your final hurdle. You're going to take your EPA form 3520-1, the one that's been stamped and signed. You're going to take your U.S. Department of Transportation form HS7. Again, stamped, signed, dated. You're going to take your state inspection that you got. You're going to take the VIN inspection that you got. You're going to take your export certificate. The export certificate is the title. That's the Japanese title. And then the translation of that export certificate, you're going to take your proof of insurance. You're going to take your application for Texas title. That's the form 130U. If you've bought a car, you've done it. It's the normal application you've always seen. And you're going to take the money that you're going to need to pay for the registration. This part can be a little scary because in all likelihood, the clerk that you're talking to has never done this kind of thing before. And they're, they're going to maybe look a little bit deer in the headlights, maybe be a little hesitant, like not sure what to do. And their biggest gripe is probably going to be the fact that you have an export certificate and it doesn't say title of a car. And, you know, they can't figure out like, oh, it doesn't say title of a car. So obviously it's not the title of a car. No, you're dealing with a, you know, a government clerk, a government worker. They might not be the happiest, you know, but you catch a lot more flies with than you do with vinegar. So be nice, explain, oh, you know, I imported this car from Japan and this is actually the title. And uh, here's the, the translation of it. This this takes the place of the title. Don't try to sound know-it-all, but sound stern enough that you know what you're talking about because that'll go a long way. And after that, they'll take everything, calculate whatever registration fees you're gonna owe and that should be it make sure you make copies though of everything that you give them because they're gonna take the export certificate from you they're gonna take those epa form the dot form have copies of it because that's your last like really line of defense in case anything ever happens down the road and they're like oh well actually can you prove this car was imported legally you can take it out boom here it is Here's the date of the car the manufacturer. Here's the date that it was released from customs, which is 25 years after the date of manufacture. And here's my, you know, exemption from EPA. So yeah, make sure you keep that stuff in a safe place on digits and on paper. And that's it, you know, four or five months later after you started looking for a car, you now have a right-hand drive JDM car in your driveway that's imported legally. You can drive around and you did it all yourself. It's not really all that hard of a process. And after doing it once, I'd never buy from an importer again. I mean, you get exactly the car you want. No one else touch it except for you. You save a ton of money. The only real downside is that you have to have all the money up front. You know, I can see a lot of like, that's like the allure to a lot of younger guys is that importers, you can finance it. You can finance the purchase instead of spending all the money down up front. But you know, I would say, I would probably say, start, try to save up, save up some money. Cause you'd be surprised how, how little money a lot of these cars can cost, especially like stuff like K trucks and K vans. They're basically free in Japan. You can buy one for less than a thousand yen. And all you're really paying is export fees and, and shipping. All right, well, if I miss anything guys, or if you have a question, go ahead and comment down below, let me know. And I'll do my best to help you out there. Uh, let me know what you guys think. And if you want more videos like this, uh, comment below, like, comment, subscribe, let me know. Also join the Discord, discord.gg slash feed. I'm on there quite a bit. You know, you can tag me if you want to yell at me. Or if you want to ask me a question, I'll be more than willing to help. Uh, I know I come off as it's kind of an asshole a lot, but um, you know, I'm really, I'm just kind of messing around. I'm pretty helpful and I, and, I, and I do want to help a lot of people out. So yeah, just let me know. And uh, thanks a lot for watching. Don't do that thumbs up. That was good as fuck. All right, Ben, thanks a lot for watching, guys. See y'all later. Good luck, Timberlake. <laughs>